Spain's Costa del Sol, home of sun, sex and money. Playground and safe haven for some of Britain's toughest gangsters. I can't think of anywhere in the world I would have rather have been than Spain because it was a, a Hollywood set. We were off the plane and it was like landing on the moon, but there was tons of money. For ten long years, this was a sun-kissed sanctuary for British prison cells. Every single infamous and notorious criminal face from London and the south of England, they're all down here. A legal loophole made them untouchable. Bundles and bundles of money. Over like 10 grand, 20 grand. It was very tiring counting it. Your fingers start getting sore. As they bought up luxury villas and made millions. I've seen as much as 4.5 million pounds in cash in a safe house being counted. Politicians were powerless, detectives frustrated. There's only so much of this you can spend on champagne and women and fast cars. The fear was it would fund criminal enterprise for years, perhaps for decades. Until with their hands tied, the police turned to a secret weapon, the media. They were thumbing their noses at British justice, and the more they did it, the grosser I got. Well, All we want to know is why it was you fled the Spain. There's a story, a big story. Told first hand by the cops and robbers who were there, this is the explosive story of how British gangsters helped transform a Spanish paradise into the Costa del Crime. Spring 1990. Great train robber Charlie Wilson is at home in his Spanish villa on the eve of his 35th wedding anniversary. Wilson's wife lets in a known visitor. Alone with Charlie, he produces a pistol and shoots Wilson point blank before fleeing. This execution showed the Costa del Crime's rules were being torn up. It ushered in an age of gun crime and street violence. The story of how British criminals colonised Spain started half a century ago with the Spanish coast unspoilt and unvisited. General Franco, Spain's dictator, believed that cash-rich tourists were the key to kick-start in a bankrupt economy. And in the 1950s, foreigners started to visit Spain's coasts to soak up some sun. We're in a, a mountain that's completely changed. This is Capranea. This is the mountain that we fell in love with, me and my brother. And um, this is where we decided to have a holiday on. London gangster John Knight is returning to his Costa del Sol bolt hole for the first time in 25 years. He was the mastermind of the multi-million pound robbery that prompted a flood of top criminals to Spain and focused the world's attention on a crooked paradise. Knight's criminal career started early. He committed his first robbery before age 10. By 20, he was a professional thief. Everyone was doing something and I took to taking and driving away lorries that were loaded. You always had a knife with you. If it was sheeted up, just split it and you know, load a scotch in here or, you know, these are televisions, uh, washing machines. <laughs> Anything that was on the lorry I had to go. We used to have a big bunch of keys and uh, eventually you found your key. Managed to get to a yard, pull it in very quickly, roll our sleeves up, and then unload. I did get arrested for it. I got arrested and it was 180,000. In them days, it was a hell of a lot of money. 180,000 of goods. Knight's claimed value would make the hole worth two and a half million pounds today. I was sent to Elwood Scrubs Prison for four and a half years, but as a man I am, I've done it. Freddie Foreman was to become a top Costa gangster as well. 
he developed an early taste for Spain. I went to Spain, yeah, yeah, a tour Molinas, I think it was. When I was 19, when I got married, for honeymoon, you know, that was really the first time, yeah. And that, that I'd got the flavour of it then, you know. I was going to Spain a, a lot before I went to live there. I used to go there back, you know. Foreman was a hardened criminal by 16. Just to nick the Never Never Lap fans outside with a travelling south when they went in and, and I'd jump up, what they called the jump up, and he used to just get in, there's only a Lucas key and drive it off, throw it out and unload it, and uh, then you'd serve the people who they were serving, but at uh, a minimum price. Foreman quickly became a face in Britain's underworld, then a ruthless enforcer for London's notorious Cray Twins. I corrupted everybody around me, all the family, and uh, I, and even those days. I mean, I, I, my mother found a, a gun in the wardrobe, you know, and she said, "If the woman, you'll get hung. You'll get hung." She used to say this to me, you know. There was a lot of guns around, and loads of those. And you thought, "Oh, you had to have one, you know, just in case you had to use it any time." August the 8th, 1963. A dramatic robbery shocked the nation. It would go on to cement the link between British gangsters and Spain. A gang of South London robbers, including Charlie Wilson and a petty crook called Ronnie Biggs, hijacked a train and stole over two and a half million pounds in cash. The great train robbers were instant heroes to prisoners like John Knight. We had a television on and uh, it come up there's a, a train robbery and they've stolen over two million pounds. And it all went quiet in the dining room. <laughs> all the faces were looking at each other and going, the chap I was sitting next to, he said, would you like to have been on that, John? I said, not many, beautiful. By then a big-time criminal, Freddie Foreman had been invited to join the train robbers. He didn't need the work. His firm had pulled off a gold robbery three months before. They came down a pub in the cut uh, to be on a Sunday morning. I, he said, we just thought we liked a bit, might be interested in you know, a bit of heavy weight on the firm, you know. So I said, uh, oh, another time, mate. And uh, they finished up getting... Um, all got to get the rest again 30 years and stuff, you know. So it was a good good thing I did turn it down, you know. Though caught and jailed, the great train robbers changed British crime. Stealing cash was the formula the Costa criminals used to get rich 20 years later. And like the Costa crooks would, they flew to the sun. After escaping from jail in the mid-60s, Biggs hid out in Spain before fleeing to South America. The train robbers were the first famous British criminals to hide out in Spain, blazing a trail that hundreds would follow. By the mid-1960s, Foreman was a jet-setter and growing to love Spain. I like the Spanish people, and I like their... their, their I know it's all manana, manana, their slow way of life, and, that they, they don't, and regulations they don't take a lot of notice of. I like all that. It's anti-authority. And I like that feeling of anti-authority. If I wanted to go on a holiday, that was where I went, you know, to Spain. Foreman was keen to buy a piece of paradise for himself. But in 1969, any plans were put on hold, thanks to a call from the craze. Early hours of the morning, I get a knock on the door, and uh, I go down, I look out the window, it's Charlie Cray. I saw it to break this nose to you, said, but the twins have... Uh, killed uh, Jack the Hat McVitie. Reggie Cray had repeatedly stabbed McVitie, a criminal associate who'd threatened to kill the twins. The crazy, on a death wish sort of situation, you know, they was uh, drinking too much, pill, taking too many speed pills, and, and uh, Ronnie Cray was on, on like, horse tranquilizers. They'd uh, done this horrible crime with Jack, in front of all 
a room full of witnesses. And those two young fellas, Crook Bears, witnessed everything. Foreman's job was to dispose of the body before police found it. It was a nightmare of a, to drive the bloody car without having a body in the back, you know what I mean? Which, and he had to look in, he could see what it was. And, um, and then I just took him away and uh, dealt with the situation afterwards, you know. Under political pressure, the police were on the crazed trail. The twins got life for murder. Foreman was jailed for 10 years as an accessory. He has never disclosed exactly where the body was taken. It's just things you take to your grave. You never talk about things like that. Uh, it's not fair. Spain welcomed 19 million tourists in 1969. Among them, many British criminals. As foreman sat behind bars, Spain exploded as a tourist destination. It was ingrained in a lot of their childhoods. Their first ever trip abroad was to Spain on a package holiday in the 60s. And, and that would open up their entire world. The Costas were a holiday destination where Britain's underworld could spend freely and not draw unwanted attention. When you've robbed a bank and you want to go somewhere and get out of the way and you also uh, want to be able to spend your money without people looking at you and thinking you're a flash Harry, go to Spain. <laughs> As long as they didn't commit crimes in Spain, the police left them alone. When we first started talking to the Spanish, it was very much, they have not committed a crime here. Trying to get the Spanish agencies to work alongside you was very difficult. But in Britain, criminals were ever more visible and violent. The 1970s saw an armed robbery epidemic. Armed robbers were going into branches of certain well-known banks, shoving a shotgun in someone's face and just walking out with, you know, several thousand pounds. There was nothing, frankly, to stop them. With the dramatic rise in armed robbery, gun crime back in Britain was at record levels. Police were under pressure from the public, politicians and the robbers. They upped their game and they became more proficient. I, you know, I hesitate to use the word professional, but that's really what it was. Policing had to change, and the change would encourage Britain's underworld to the Spanish costas in ever greater numbers. What you saw was the rise of the intelligence branch. Technology was improving, interception was improving, things like putting bugs in was all improving. So police were doing much more surveillance. It was the start of a technological revolution. Flaunting their newfound wealth at home could put gangsters behind bars. More and more headed to Spain to let off steam and spend stolen cash. When they had some real money, where else to go? Spain. That's where they felt comfortable. That's where they could get an English breakfast and a pint and, and lots of friends and associates around them. So they went off to Spain and they bought very nice villas instead of staying in holiday hotels. John Knight and his brother Ronnie were among the first British criminals who bought property in Spain, financed in part by their criminal activity in the UK. The Knight's villa, El Limonar, would become the symbol of the Costa del Crime lifestyle. British police could only look on with anger and frustration as criminals lived in Spain scot-free. But some refused to wait for politicians to act. One of the first cops to work with Spanish police was Tony Lundy. Together, they chased down British criminals in Spain without a treaty. I was on the flying squad as a chief inspector and I'd started a series of super grasses in North London. One of the super grasses named a man called Morris as taking part in a very nasty armed robbery in a private house and told us that he'd actually gone out to Spain. Local police tricked Mickey Morris into returning to Britain voluntarily to change his passport. The minute he arrived in London, Lundy nabbed him. He was sentenced to 14 years in jail. You deal on a direct basis, you achieve results. 
Lundy and the Spanish then began to eavesdrop on other British criminals who were convinced they were beyond the law. They would sit there and talk and make phone calls or whatever, believing nobody had any interest in them whatsoever. They were, they were free from the British um, forces, so to speak, you know, and thought, we're here, Spain's no interest in us, and uh, we can, you know, live the good life, talk freely, etc., which, of course, was their undoing, because that led to the arrest yeah. of dozens of other criminals. Despite Lundy's successes, most British criminals were living the high life, free from extradition and ploughing ill-gotten gains into property. People who were running fraudulent enterprises, what were they doing? That was being invested in. Spain was the place to invest, wasn't it? I mean, the property market was, was accelerating all the time in Spain, so you could guarantee if you put money into something it would increase, and so they were doing it. I can't think of anywhere in the world where I would have rather have been than rather in Spain because it was like a Hollywood set. It was everything was going on there, and everybody had plenty of money. I mean, and they was there because they was like similar circumstances to me myself. There was like the extreme robbers like Charlie Wilson and Co. And they was all old pals from years ago. And, uh, of course, we all congregated there. We invested our money in, in clubs and apartments and villas and felt safe, you know, which we all felt very safe there. It was a really fun time. Initially, criminals steered clear of committing crime in Spain. They knew that could jeopardise their safe haven in the sun. What they normally do is they rest here and when they get a job in England, they go back to England and come back. They would go back, do we'll another find. job, come yeah. back again, buy another apartment, yeah. spend some of the money on some more property and so on. In Britain, armed robbery continued to rise. In 1982, there were 1,772 robberies in London alone. 34 armed robberies a week, every week in a single city. Armed robbery had gone literally through the roof. Every day there were shootings and robberies, security vehicles and so on. You'd come into work on a Friday expecting that there would be two or three armed robberies, perhaps on your patch alone. So it was really, really quite intense. As the number of robberies increased, so did the robbers' greed. The 1983 Security Express robbery would make Spain's infamous residents front page news for years. John Knight was its mastermind. He spent the 1970s shuttling between London and Spain, building up the sumptuous villa he shared with brother Ronnie. On one trip to London, he chanced upon the job that was to change his life. It was over a cup of tea in a cab. A friend of mine told me about a Security Express van opposite a bank and it was too early for delivery. I said, yes, that is unusual. I said, we'll wait a little while longer and we had an extra cup of tea. We looked and as the bank opened at nine o'clock, they started delivering. That wasn't loaded this morning. That must have been overnight. We started firing it and checking it out, and uh, we ended up in Curtin Road. Curtin Road was the depot for cash movers, Security Express. It's all changed. Brings back memories. John broke into the building next door to watch the depot. I managed to go into the front of the building, which done me nicely. It overlooked Security Express. I was so pleased. That was the beginning of this robbery. So much work went into it, just finding out how many people were going in that building. We eventually, over a period of time on surveillance, see that there was eight to nine men going in. Months watching showed John a way in. Guards turned off the alarms to collect milk for their tea. He also spotted surveillance camera blind spots that would allow men to get in the yard unnoticed. 
these are um, a small lot for grasses that I use when I was in this building. These were lovely, they done the job for us, even having a close-up on the back door where the guard come out and got his milk. After a full year of surveillance, the robbery was set for Easter. We left Security Express. It's time. So, I went down, opened this door, looked down the alleyway, clear, ladder across the ways, on the wall, and one of the firm gave me the other ladder. I propped it over the other side, up I went, over, looked over the wall and went, and they were all coming out individually. We made our way round the back of the vans. We could hear the gold change over from there. We were waiting for him to come down and pick his milk up. And as the door opened, I looked round and put my hand up, pushed the door open and got hold of him. And we just captured everyone and tied them up. Then there was a waiting game for the locks to go off for the safe. Freddie Foreman has written about the details of the Security Express job. All I know is that um, it was well timed. Was it coincided with the uh, the, uh, the House Court exhibition, so there'd be more cash in, in uh, and uh, it, it was executed in a professional way. Eight drivers was laid down, roped up, and. Uh, for, for Threatened, uh, oh, oh, there's, there's one supposed to be threatened. One of the security express workers refused to cooperate at first. The robbers threatened to set him alight. He was a very stubborn man, but I think this was taken out of the cabinet and it was smelt, maybe it's spilt over him a bit. So, look, you know, as a frightener. On any job that a villain does, or an armed robber does, it's a frightener. If they portray it as like pulling a gun and the petrol off someone, when in fact all that apparently happened was shaking a little bit of lighter fuel under a nose, you know, and ran in a box of Swan Vestas. That was all that was uh, referred to. And, and nobody got injured, and nobody went to hospital. I've seen so many young guys who've worked in banks, building societies, whatever, who have been completely traumatised by what's happened to them. There is also a level of intimidation and violence that they bring, whether the gun is loaded or not. I've had many of my officers shot at in the past, one taking a bullet across the head from a machine gun. These are violent, dangerous people. The amount of cash at Security Express surprised even the armed robbers who stole it. Six and a half million pounds. We didn't know at the time. We had to wait patiently for main two guards with keys, and there was an electrical device on the big safe. And it was nine o'clock. They clicked off. They went and opened the vaults up, and there it was, full up with money. Bundles and bundles of money. Our chap outside, one of the firm, drove the vehicle in and loaded up like Security Express were loading their vehicles. Packed all the ladders in and made our way to our destination. It turned out a perfect job. We didn't know at the time that it would be perfect, but it worked out that way. And it was a brilliant, brilliant robbery. For the robbers, everything had gone to plan, and they now had over £6 million in cash. But police surveillance and criminal stupidity would scupper the whole operation and land its masterminds in jail. The robbers split up, and John Knight flew back to Spain, where brother Ronnie threw him a surprise party at a rented villa. The mood was jubilant. Photographs were taken. 
a mistake that had repercussions for the future of the Costa del Crime itself. The men in the photo would become suspects. They included Freddie Foreman, Ronnie Everett, John Mason, and the Knight Brothers. All of a sudden, uh, Fred walked in, uh, Everett walked in, and uh, Mason walked in. I had a straw out on, actually. I had a talk in there, laughing, having a drink. It was a photo that should never have been taken, for a start. First, to pose for a photo like that was ridiculous and stupid to do it. I, I'm trying to hide myself in it, and I know John was trying to hide himself in it with a cigar and thing. I said, don't let this picture get leave Spain, or don't, you know, don't let it go back to England. We should have took the picture out of the camera and destroyed it. But the photo did make it back to Britain, and it went on to put all the men in the frame for robbery. John Knight was the first to suffer. I come back, and um, within a week or two, I, I found out that someone was arrested for it. Now I've got to be careful. John Knight was connected to the Security Express robbery and arrested in 1984. When the Spanish photo was discovered, the authorities thought it showed the gang celebrating. They found the photo and they said, well, there's, that's John over the back there, hiding behind with his straw out on. We've got him. These are in the frame. And that's how it all started with uh, Ronnie, John, Everett and Fulman. I went to Spain on the day that Johnny Knight got arrested. Just as a precaution, really, I thought, well, I think I'd better just have a short holiday till things calm down, because they was on the right track, wasn't they, you see? John Knight was given 22 years in jail for robbery. Foreman, Ronnie Knight, Everett and Mason were now prime suspects and the Costa del Crime's royalty. Eight months after Security Express, 25 million pounds worth of gold was snatched from a warehouse at Heathrow Airport. Known as Brink's Matt, this robbery had top cops like Roy Ram worried. Security Express and Brink's Matt made lots of differences. One of the major differences was the Yard's fear of the amount of money that was being pumped into the criminal economy. The fear was that, you know, there's only so much of this you can spend on champagne and women and fast cars. What's going to happen to the rest of it? And it was being reinvested. And the fear was it was being reinvested in drugs, in firearms, and in the criminal enterprises. And that it would fund criminal enterprise for years, perhaps for decades. These two robberies alone netted a staggering £75 million in today's money. Suspected robbers were living sweetly in Spain. They were untouchable. Until now, British criminals had resisted the temptation to indulge in crime within Spain. That was changing. When robber Dave Kent was released from British prison in July 1985, he was sent a ticket to Spain by Underworld Friends. It was the start of a new life for him and of a new era for the Costa del Crime. Reminds me of money, this place, because I earned a lot of money. It was probably one of the best places on the coast to land contraband. If you can look out today, you can see that the sea is like a mill pond and you could actually walk out for the best part of 200 yards here. Directly over there to the right, you will see a skyscraper, which is the only skyscraper on this coast. It only took someone to be on the top floor there as an observation point, and on from a clear day, you can see right the way across to Morocco. What's over there is probably gold to some people, but it's just cannabis resin. If there were 10 bales to unload, then you'd have five people working on the beach. One person for two bales. 
So it was just one trip and gone. That was their job. Pick up two bales and put it in the van or put it in a car, wherever it's got to go. They did it. They did their job. They got paid for bringing their 50 kilos. And they, you know, they could get paid a £1,000 for just carrying two bags a matter of 20 yards. I'd carry a, a small knife like this with me. I'd open the bale up here on the shore just to check what it was in there. Once I'd made that clear, then we pick the bales up and then you're walking up the beach as quick as possible. Then there's someone that would be there by the cars. And then voila, open the boot, gear in. From the time you get to the beach to here, roughly about a minute and away. Each consignment will be taken to a safe house and unloaded. It's wrapped in a seal-proof, airtight um, wrapping. Could be from anything from clear film to brown tape to electrical tape. The people I work for wrapping used to pay me £10 a kilo. So if there was a thousand kilos a month to wrap, that's not a bad wage, £10,000 a month, just for wrapping. Drug trafficking alone brought millions of pounds worth of criminal money streaming into the costas during the 1980s. I've seen as much as 4.5 million pounds in, in cash in a safe house being counted. Andalusia started to be one of the main places in the world for smuggling marijuana. 90% of some kinds of marijuana uh, come, come across the Gibraltar Strait. So it's a very important business. It wasn't just the drugs. Criminality funded a massive property development boom. A lot of money was arriving, much more than the money which could come from drug trafficking, which is a lot. flowing into Spain also prompted imaginative new crimes. Rich criminals had money to burn, and self-confessed fraudster Paul Grimshaw was happy to help. I got involved with a, with a car ringing group. There was a huge demand uh, in Africa, North Africa, Morocco especially, for British and European high-value vehicles. Somebody down there that didn't want to pay £150,000 for that Bentley or for that Mercedes, but would quite willingly give 35, 45, maybe 50,000 pounds. I was able to, to help with the procurement of those um, and to outwardly legitimize the paperwork. You could possibly make 10 to 15,000 pounds per vehicle. And of course, some of the convoys were going down with half a dozen vehicles per month. You could make 100,000 pounds. By now, the story of how swaggering crooks on the Costa del Sol were avoiding arrest was making big headlines. There are at least a hundred fugitives along the coast. With John Knight in jail, the media focused on his brother, Ronnie. It was very upsetting that I'm doing 22 years and it's a glorious life for anybody else. Good luck to him. But I used to be asked in there, even by officers, prison officers in prison. Ron's in the paper again. You've been mentioned there. John Knight's brother, Ron Knight's on the run in Spain, you know, and all that. And it was a big thing at the time. And it was a serious robbery. And a lot of money. High profile newspaper stories showing criminals enjoying the costas put pressure on politicians to close the legal loophole. And in 1985, as Spain was to join the European Union, a new binding extradition treaty came into force. Some hoped it was the end for the Costa del Crime. Hey presto, the Costa del Crime is out of business. But is it? But it couldn't be applied retrospectively. British criminals were safe from arrest if they were in Spain before 1985. They looked like the Security Express suspects had really got away with it. Angry and frustrated, British cops turned to the media. Roger Cook, 
a journalist with a reputation for fearless doorstepping of criminals, was given a helping hand by Scotland Yard. The press coverage was perfectly correct. They were living the high life, you know, Ferraris, uh, gold Rolexes, all the trappings of wealth, um, endless champagne parties. I mean, they really were. They were thumbing their noses at British justice. And the more they did it, the crosser I got. One of our researchers was in the Scotland Yard at one stage, talking to officers, and then he said, does this make you cross too? Not off, they said. Uh, and the floodgates opened. Would you like to do something about it? Because we can't. We can go and watch, but we can't do anything. And we know where they all are. So we were given all the information. Among Cook's targets was Freddie Foreman, long suspected of the Security Express robbery. He was just making a name for himself at the time, wasn't he? He wanted you to go out and attack him and a bit masochistic, I think he was. Security Express robber Clifford Sachs also took offence at Cook's questions. All we want to know is why it was you fled to Spain. First of all, he threw a large glass ashtray at me. Didn't get my head, but bounced off my shoulder. Next thing you know, he's been let go by the people who were restraining him and he's out thumping me heavily uh, for my pains. I've got a very large black eye and a lot of other assorted bruises. He loved that because that was good, good coverage, wasn't it? So that's the sort of thing he was encouraging to do. No, seriously, that's all we... Oh. Hey, stop it, stop it. He didn't have any answers to questions. People liked encounters at the end of the programme. They liked a conclusion, they liked to see people being brought to book, as it were, and even if you got not much of a response, they, they ran away or they threw a punch, it showed these people up for what they were. People began to take it seriously that these people were thumbing their nose at British justice, and the coverage on, in newspapers began to change from almost grudging admiration to how could they possibly do this. And I think eventually, the authorities on both sides of the, of the water were embarrassed into making an extradition treaty actually work properly. The crap hit the fan, hadn't it, you know, and that, we knew then that was bad. Cook's primetime TV show, The Cook Report, watched by 10 million viewers, changed things. Spain wanted to be famous for happy holidays, not harbouring British criminals. It was only when they saw the reputational damage it was doing to Spain and its prime holiday resorts that they started to react. And it was only after Roger Cook and things that followed, these things were on the front pages, they were on the TV, and people started to ask questions of politicians, what are you doing about this? How can people escape so easily? So, you know, this kind of motivated the Foreign Office to get involved, and I think that you know, post these kinds of programmes, there was a much greater level of cooperation. The Costa Crooks now had a growing list of problems. First, the media. We've even managed to trace a few the police on both sides of the water had lost track of. Then other gangsters. With millions at stake, international villains wanted a piece of the action. Turf wars erupted. Foreman felt singled out by Spanish police. It got the needle with me, the, the, the Spanish police. If, if somebody got washed up down in Fuengarola on the beach, you know, and they found people with heads missing and hands missing and people being shot in the head up in the mountains. And every time something like that cropped up, I was being dragged up to my bayonet and they're showing me photos. I said, I don't want to look at photos of dead people. You know, what you, what you, and what you come, got me up here for? And they was always driving me mad, you know. On July the 28th, 1989, Foreman's days on the Costa came to an end. Spanish police seized and deported him. I was forcibly taken to the neck, to, to my bear, and then rushed to the airport, which I tried to crush the car in the back of the car. The murder of great train robber Charlie Wilson, just three weeks after Foreman was jailed, was a stark sign that the Costa del Crime's glory days were over. A seasoned drug baron, Wilson, was a victim of growing violence in the drug trade. Charlie's wife knew the person and felt safe because he was a face from South London. She just went in to make a cup of tea in her kitchen and he walked out to where Charlie was with his dog around the pool and they, the guy uh, took terrible advantage of him. Charlie had no fear of the person. 
but he was someone to put a contract out on him and he shot him in the head. The residents of the Costa del Crime always knew their illegal activities were high risk. Some, like Wilson, were murdered. Others were jailed. In 1998, Dave Kent received a seven-year sentence for possession of cannabis with intent to supply. The stakes are very, very high, but then again, the rewards are very, very high. And obviously, if, if you play for high stakes, then you expect to get good rewards. You're putting yourself in jeopardy of losing liberty. And that's what I did, and I paid the price. Dave Kent maintains that he has not been involved in crime since then. Freddie Foreman also claims to have retired from crime. He now only goes to Spain on holiday. I was at the Old Bailey since 1948, and I've appeared there six times at the number one court, you know, all through my whole career. So it's not that clever, it's not that good. You've got to take your chance, if you take your chances, you play for high stakes, you've got to take the rough with the smooth. I mean, if, if you go fall over, you're in trouble. John Knight was bankrupted by the court. He lost his villa and all his assets. Now, for the first time in a quarter of a century, he's returning to see the house he loved and lost in Spain. It was, it was sorrowful going back after an holiday from out. Looking at that sea over the top of a Viliminal has brought back beautiful memories. I never did come back here. Unfortunately, I went away. But that villa, to my family, is history. I think there's a little bit of history there. There's a story, a big story. And sometimes, you know, I'm glad to be here to look at it. Sometimes, yeah, I say that's mine, but it's not mine. And, um... I didn't ever think that Ronnie would lose this place. I'm a bit sick. And I think anyone would be the same, in the same frame of mind. You know, we all go away in our holidays in hotels and small villas and all that, but uh, there's nothing like that. I should have a tear in my eye, 